Hi again. We're back for another installation of the Razorback screencast. So this time I wanted to start with the arms again. We've been focusing a lot on these arms, getting them to look all nice and smooth, giving them a little bit of style, but there's something that we haven't really been focusing on. Uh, the articulation of them. How, how far can they reach? Will they be able to do their job? So I was playing with this off 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 camera uh, when I was not recording and I found a few problems so if we were to deploy the arm by bringing it out to you know roughly level and then stretch the arm outward by unfolding it using these null objects that we created as pivots I'm just going to not unfold it fully, but just partially. And then rotate the blade out. Everything looks fine from the top, but from the side, it's it's kind of strange. Um, right now, there's really no way for this blade to be angled at any angle other than this right here. So what I was thinking is maybe we can put a pivot at the base um, right here. And I thought that would be pretty cool, but you are now moving the entire large arm around. That may not be very efficient. So then I started to think, what if there was a pivot right here? And it essentially allowed the, uh, let's see if I can select all the necessary components. Um, well, what if it essentially allowed the blade to be rotated like this on the end of the arm? I think that would be really cool. So I started to think about what would need to be considered before we do something like that. And here's what I came up with. So we would need to make sure that there was a disc that represented the degrees of freedom that this arm has, uh, where, the, where the blade is, in other words. So if I were to create a disc at the end here where the plate is, and let's see if we can change its orientation. There we go. We can now bring it out to the space that this blade occupies. We now have an idea of where the blade reaches. Now, the question I'd like to answer is what happens if we rotate this end of the arm to this disc? Well, we can see here that we have the uh, we have the risk of cutting the arm itself, so that's not very good. Uh, let's see what happens if we rotate it the other way. If we rotate the blade up. We have the risk of cutting ourselves right here. Now, this won't be a problem if, whenever we're going to spin the blade, we level it out first. Um, so I think I think I'd like to play with this a little bit. And uh, I think that's what the screencast will be. Let's just take a look at this uh, this arm and how we could maybe sever the arm right here, pretty pretty close to halfway along, and maybe rig it up so that it can rotate a little bit. To start with this, let's look at the structure. We have small arm null. That's right here. It points to this point, and then we have end arm null. And right now, its axis is sort of arbitrary. Um, if we set its axis to zero, it, it doesn't really point anywhere special. So I think what I'd like to do to start off is to rotate this blade so that it's there. That feels like it should be about zero. And then adjust its axis so that its axis is now zeroed out. It's, it's relative to the object, relative to its parents, so that won't, work, that won't work either. We actually need to align the blue axis here with the blade. So now it's a lot more intentionally aligned. So once we have that, I'm going to bring it out at sort of a right angle, kind of like that. 
so it's almost parallel with this segment and what we're essentially about to do is we're going to cut this curved arm right about here and we need to be careful about how we do that because it may actually prevent it from folding so maybe we need to cut it further up close to this bulge because when we cut it, we're going to place a cylinder there as sort of a pivot point. Let's see if I can sort of explain that a little bit better. So I'm just sort of making this up as I go along. But if we were to squash the cylinder down and use it as sort of a pivot point, Let's go with 12 segments for now. And we can essentially move it right here to where it would live. So I know this is straight up and down. So we can move that so it intersects these lines that we're thinking of modifying. And same thing here, we know this is straight across. So I can move that to about halfway there. And then we can reduce the radius. I'm thinking of something like that. So that could be our pivot point, maybe right there. I'm just sort of moving it around until it feels OK. Now, if this was our pivot point at that size, how would that influence what we've already got going here? It means that from here down, we can sort of twist it like a wrist. And how does it look when it's all folded up? So let's fold the pivot back up. Oop, looks like we left it there. It wasn't in the hierarchy. So I'm going to move it to the small arm null. And we can then go to our pivot null object and reduce its banking angle to zero. That brings it back in board. And let's just fold the arm back up. So if we bring this down, sort of intersects right there. And what I'm thinking is if we were to bring it down to its limit, now we were designing this limit in the last video, I think, right there, where would this pivot have to be so that it doesn't get in the way? It actually looks like it could be here. That actually looks like a really good spot. Because that way, it's, it's, it's allowed to be bulky. It's actually allowed to be a little bit bulkier than it is right now. So we can increase its size a little bit. Let's just try to center it roughly. OK, so it would need to rotate downwards like that. Again, I'm just sort of doing this by eye. I'm just sort of looking at it and saying, OK, what would this have to do? What would it have to be? All I know is that this disc would sort of represent the, the, the bearing or the area where the arm would marry. I think that would work. Now, how does this affect our end arm null with its ability to rotate? It looks like it'll do just fine. So the idea is that there would be a large motor in one of these parts of the arm and it would be geared right here so that we could essentially twist this arm about this axis. I think it'll make a lot more sense as we move on to the actual cutting and rejoining of this, uh, this area. So I think I'm going to hide some of this other stuff and then we can get started on that. So the first thing we need to do is actually cut this into two objects. Well, maybe we'd need two objects before we even think about cutting it. So right now we have the small arm null. And this is still going to be the base of the arm. What we're going to do is essentially keep this as an imaginary object that extends all the way. But now we want a second object that starts right here and includes the blade assembly. 
So maybe the best way to visualize this is just to do it. So right now the end arm null is a child of small arm null. We're going to have a second small arm. So let's copy the entire small arm hierarchy and just put it at the end of itself. Now, now we have this small arm hierarchy and another one right here. Let's remove the end arm null from the first hierarchy. So we just have small arm null, small arm. I'm just going to turn on polygon mode so we can see what it is when I select small arm. We have cylinder and um, and then we have small arm null again with a cylinder and another small arm. Then we have end arm null as a child of it. So, so I'm just going to not call this small arm but call this wrist or forearm. Let's try forearm. Well, forearm null to keep with our naming convention. So the next step, I think, is to actually just start cutting and deleting geometry. If we look at polygon mode here and we go from the side, we can see that it sort of intersects at a strange angle. We can, we can work with that. So let's just move it a little bit. And we may need to select both small arms. You can move the points of both objects at the same time. And let's just move it a little bit more to the center. I think that works fine. Now, let's select these points and uh, squash them down to zero. And then rotate them again. So they're nice and straight. And now we have that area. So we take our first small arm, the part that we want to occupy, just this part and we essentially delete all of these points and what that leaves us with is a small arm that just goes to there and we take our other small arm the upper part and we delete all the points below so what we have now is we have small arm null contains all this stuff you know if we if we rotate it we still get all that moving but if we select the forearm we can move this stuff independently and we, the first thing we need to do is move the center point of this object. So we have a cylinder right here. And the easiest way to move the pivot point of this upper arm area to the cylinder is just to duplicate the cylinder, make the forearm null a child of the cylinder. So its parent's origin is here, its origin is back here. And then we just select the axis mode and we move its position and rotation to that point. So now we have a situation where we can rotate the upper part of this arm. And that's what we really want. So now we have a forearm object. We have a cylinder. We have another cylinder. So now we need to uh, do some modifications to these cylinders. So the first problem is that they're right on top of each other. An easy fix for that is to change it to two height segments. So now the cylinders each have a part, each have a half really, and we can select these cylinders, hit C to convert them to edit editable polygons, and then we can select all the faces and we do our optimize command. So now they're all connected. So we have one cylinder, two cylinders. And what we can do is use the loop selection to select this band that we want to delete because this is the forearm. So we don't want this aft part. So we can use the loop selection to select that first bit and then switch to fill selection, hold shift and select the inboard part. Now we can hit delete and we do the exact opposite of that for the other side. So we use loop selection followed by fill selection, hold shift, delete. And now we have two independent objects. So just to make things a little quick and easy, these objects will 
mate right here, there will be a seam where they connect. So let's make that seam. If I go to edge mode and we look at these, what we should see is two cylinders, each of them open-ended right there. So I think the easiest way to bring these points in to give it that look is to select both cylinders and use the lasso selection in edge mode to select the edges where they meet. So now we have those edges selected. Now we can use the scale tool and uh, so if you scale that down it'll just shrink them. That's interesting. It looks like there's some extra stuff that I'm not seeing. That's one. This is the other. Ah, here's this third cylinder we used to position it. We can delete that and we can just leave it at this now because we've already established our new pivot point. So, okay, we have our two cylinders. It still has those edges selected. And normally you can scale those up and down, it gives you that effect. But in Cinema R13 and higher, I believe, you can hold Control and Scale, and it actually creates new geometry. So we can create some new geometry down to about there. And what this does is it gives us a hard corner. So let's do these one at a time. So we see now that we have a hard corner right here. And we can do a bevel. I'll do subdivision of two. Don't create any end gons, we don't need to. It's a convex bevel, and we just sort of bevel it like that. We can then select the other cylinder, uh, do a loop selection, uh, return to our bevel tool, and just hit apply to apply the exact same transform we just did. So now we have a place where these two arms meet, and it seems sort of plausible that they would meet quite precisely right there. My only critique of this is that that bevel is too large, so I'm going to go back and redo it. So our edges are still selected. I can just double check that by selecting both cylinders using lasso selection and selecting these edges again. Now we can bevel. We can bevel both objects at the same time. That's not a problem. Oh, okay, I missed that. I still need to do this loop selection one at a time, so I'll select the first cylinder and the second cylinder. And now I have both selected. And so now I can do the bevel. Let's do a nice tight bevel like that. So that's a lot nicer. And I guess the next step would be to merge these in, but we're not going to do that yet. Let's focus some more on this actual mechanism. So what we have now is we have um, two distinct sets of hierarchy and geometry. So we have this forearm area, we have the small arm, and the small arm null. So the small arm null contains everything, and the forearm null will rotate like this. So let's see how this works in the grand scheme of things before moving any further. Let's turn the symmetry back on. Let's turn some of the bike back on. And let's try unfolding the machine again. So if we bring the pivot out, and then we go to the top view and start extending the arms. So we pull out the large arm, followed by the small arm, followed by the end arm, which is essentially the blade. We can sort of unfold the arms of the machine but then we can actually rotate the forearm null to point it up or down. Now again, I'm not sure how well this is going to work, but let's see. This means that we could maybe bring our pivot up like this and rotate our forearm to get the blade pointing down. And that actually looks really cool. So if we wanted to cut something at an angle like this, we could do it. 
sort of an angle coming down this way. If you wanted to cut at an angle going up the opposite way, we could actually do that as well. This is still going to be difficult to manipulate to a point because it is a robot and uh, our, our human arms are used to just simply reaching for whatever we want. There's going to be a bit more calculation involved in creating a strike with this machine. But that actually lends opportunity for, you know, artistic freedom. We can we can actually bring the arms close to inboard like this and then just rotate the forearm null and it actually points our blades up or down. So you can actually go from a folded position like we were before to an unfolded position with the blades at your side like this. And then perhaps you could rotate it out like this and then start swinging it around for like intimidation and you can end in a strike at a precise angle like we saw earlier. So I think this works pretty well. Yeah, we could probably leave it at this point. Uh, the next video could be merging these, uh, m sort of merging those cylinders together. Might be a nice place to start. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to fold things back up. And I think I'm going to call that a video. So I'll start by moving the pivot back up. And... So the forearm is actually stowed away like this. And then the end arm will be brought down like that. Small arm needs to be collapsed onto the large arm. And then the large arm sort of determines the final resting position like right here. And we can probably lower these end arms as much as we want until they hit the motor. So I think that works pretty well. It definitely provides a lot more freedom of rotation to those arms. Uh, it provides us a little bit more artistic freedom when posing the motorcycle. We can we can sort of pose it so that it uh so that it looks a little bit more postured or intimidating. And I think that's pretty good. So I hope you enjoyed this video and uh until next time, see ya.